All right, this lecture is going to focus on uh, two things, creating a vision framework and a uh, prospectus. And uh, so these are things that uh, as you're, uh, you know, you've kind of already uh, discerned your calling, uh, you have, um, you know, felt where God, where God is leading you, the context, the city that he's leading you to. Uh, mm -hmm. You've probably done some training and some other things. And so uh, the next part is, well, what is your vision uh, for planning a church? Uh, what does that look like? And so uh, this was a struggle for me as we were um, preparing this last year for Calgary um, because many church planting prospectuses um, or ideas or visions really focus on how do we, what do we envision this single church becoming? Uh, which is not a not a bad thing at all. Um, we want to plant a church. Sometimes we already have the name of the church um, already established, or they have a small group already meeting, or whatever it is. And uh, the, but the prospectus, the the vision for it, uh, largely says here here is how we want to plant this one church. Here's what it will look like, and here's our vision for it. It's not a bad thing at all. Uh, but for me personally, we'll talk about kind of personal wiring in just a minute. Uh, but for me personally. I didn't, I didn't really have a vision for just planting a church. Um, we're, we've been called to a city that is 95% lost. Uh, planting one church is barely going to make a dent. Now we're going to start there, but we don't want to end there. And so our vision was really for a whole city. And so you're going to, you'll wrestle with that tension no matter what type of ministry you'll be in, whether you're in an established church, revitalizing, replanting, or planting a new church. You'll always want to struggle with, are we, are we trying to just take care of this one church? especially in a revitalization effort, you know, you have to get yourself healthy before you can help others, and that's the reality. But it, does your revitalization vision stop at, we've gotten this church to health? Should it also include multiplication? What is the future vision for the church? That way the church doesn't see that, oh, we're just going to get out of our slump that we've been in for 30 years, and we will uh, be a good, healthy church and have a lot of young, vibrant families and a lot of really neat ministries. Cast a vision that goes beyond that. Cast a vision that we're actually going to use this church to reach our city and our world for the gospel. And so um, that applies to planting, replanting, and other things as well. Um, even if you're uh, in youth ministry or children's ministry or worship ministry or some type of a collegiate parachurch ministry, whatever it is, um, do you have a vision for something beyond just the single ministry that you're doing? And so for us in Calgary, uh, we don't want to plant just one church. We want to plant dozens of churches. And uh, I'll explain mm -hmm. Uh, once we get to my sample of a prospectus, you'll see that in a second. Uh, but let's start, first talk about creating a vision framework. Uh, now, there's a book called uh, Church Unique, uh, written by uh, Will Mancini. And I don't have the dust jacket on, but I think you can see that okay. So it's called Church Unique, uh, Will Mancini. Uh, fantastic book to read. Before you jump into any type of ministry, um, uh, just church planting, revitalizing, or pastoring an established church, you need to read this book. Okay. Uh, I was very close to making it required, uh, but I couldn't see how it really fit as a whole book in this class, but it may be something that I have, uh, I'll use in another class. But it's a great book about creating a vision framework, uh, not just saying uh, we want to glorify Jesus uh, by doing some good things in our city. Well, that's not a bad thing, but what is that statement? Is that your vision statement or is that a mission statement? Uh, many churches actually combine a mission slash vision statement, uh, but Mancini does really well in actually answering for us the difference between a mission statement and a vision statement, and then along with some other components of what he calls a vision framework. So let's jump right into that. Uh, the first thing you do before you create a vision framework, Mancini guides you through uh, developing what's called a kingdom concept. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but I do want to touch on these um, because it really sets up the next uh, section. First of all, you look at your local predicament, your context. Uh, what are the needs of the city that God has called you to? All right, so for here in Calgary, uh, we uh, don't have a lot of material needs here. It's a very affluent city. It's a very young city. Very, uh, the economy is doing pretty well here. There, um, a lot of uh, young families have moved here for work, and it's a very grow. It's a, it's a rapidly growing city. So you really look at it and say, well, there's not a lot of need there. Well, no, there's, poverty is low, uh, homelessness is low, hunger is low, and so you think, well, what is the predicament? Well, the predicament here is that 95% of people have no clue who Jesus is. That's a spiritual predicament. So I'm in a I'm in a community in a city uh, that's really in paradox. It is material prosperity with co-mingled with spiritual poverty. And so our local predicament is that there aren't enough disciples in the city to really make a large kingdom impact. And so we need more Christians and we need more churches. So that's our local predicament: is that we need 
more uh, disciples, leaders, and churches here in the area. Well, then you look at collective potential. Collective potential looks at your team. Now, uh, for us, we are we we have a very very small church planting team. Me, my wife, my 20 month old son, and our dog. And then we have a uh, graduate student who um, is at the seminary nearby. She moved up from Calvary and Winston Salem uh, to join us. Uh, and then we have another gentleman uh, who's actually in uh, this class uh, during the time I'm recording now, Nicomas, who is looking to come up later uh, in the year and do some summer work, and then maybe start class here in the fall. And so. Our team is very, very small. We have a very small church planting team because we want more of our team to come from the harvest, to come from lost people we're discipling to become uh, part of this new church. Uh, and plus, with crossing over to a new country, it's hard to bring 25, 30 people for a, a core group with us um, because it is a 2,700 mile trip across uh, to another border and not just uh, going to a neighboring city. And so visas and different things come into play. Um, so for us, we have to look at what is our team dynamic and we haven't all got together as much yet because we literally just moved here. Um, but even for my wife and I, we started discussing what is the potential between uh, me and my wife for leading in this new work? What is our heart? Uh, what kind of skills do we have? Uh, we've talked in other classes about the APES, Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Shepherd, Teacher. Which which are, which are my, my, my role, my gifting? What are my wife's spiritual gifts? Uh, what are my strengths and hers? And then those on our team as well. So you look at those uh, concepts as well. You look at what is the potential that is in our team. And the third thing you look at is your leadership passion. Uh, what do you as a leader have a heart for? And so for me personally, I've just mentioned how I didn't want to just plant a church. I want to plant dozens of churches. I want to be a part of planting several churches. I want to uh, plant the first church and then raise up a leader very quickly to take my place and we move on to another area. Okay, and as we're doing that, we're also sending out new people. And so my passion really is not to plant a church and be there for 20, 30 years, which is a great thing. Many pastors have done that, and they have become uh, church multiplication centers, which is great. I'm just not personally wired for that. Um, I, I can't stay settled somewhere for longer than three or four years. And so we have enough room in Calgary to move around, um, but that's, that is my heart, my passion. And so we take all those concepts together uh, Mancini walks you through how to develop a kingdom concept for what God wants you to do. And this really plays in and lets you uh, transition into uh, creating your vision, uh, your vision statement. And so for us, with our, our predicament of uh, high-level lostness and not enough churches, our collective potential of being very small, but desiring to raise from the harvest and using the gifts that we have, um, and then my passion for wanting to raise up, our kingdom concept simply is we want to collaborate with other churches to raise up more leaders to raise up more disciples. You'll see in our mission statement uh, in a little bit is we want to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. We want to do that in collaboration with a handful of churches that do exist. We want to meet the Christians who are here, uh, the 5%. We want to meet some of those and have them help us and train uh, to do uh, expand even more in our evangelism. So our kingdom concept becomes almost this paragraph statement uh, and I've got mine handwritten somewhere in a box. I can't, uh, I couldn't, I, I couldn't find it before uh, recording this. Uh, but our kingdom concept was essentially because of the dire need of more churches for Calgary, we must collaborate with other churches in order to see more disciples, leaders, and churches started, uh, more disciples raised up, more leaders developed, more churches started. So that was our kingdom concept. So Mancini walks you through this, and then he helps you develop what's called a vision frame. So picture this um, actually like a picture frame would be. Uh, you have the middle picture, uh, maybe it's a, a picture of a you and your significant other or you climbing a mountain or whatever it is. You have your, 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 your snapshot in the middle and then you have four pieces of a frame that outline your um, picture. And so here is the vision frame. So you can see your vision is kind of like the picture in the middle and the frame edges are your mission, your values, your measures, and your strategy. And so Mancini has a chapter for each of these and walks you through it, gives you the questions to ask, gives you samples. It it's really is fantastic. And I actually used the book as I was developing our own vision framework uh, for Calgary. And so I'm going to show you a sample of mine in just a minute. But let's walk through these and uh, look at each component. And I'll walk kind of through the suggested way that he suggests uh, starting with first. And you actually don't start with your vision first. Vision is actually last. You start with your values. Why are we doing what we're doing? My wife and I had to stop and ask, why are we moving to Calgary? Why are we selling our home in North Carolina? Why are we selling a car? Why are we fitting out um, extra clothes and toys and furniture and that sort of thing? Why are we doing this uh, to go to Calgary? And so our values really come down to what we hold deep down as core beliefs. And what we, so we do value things like scripture. We value things like prayer. We value things like the working of the Holy Spirit. 
And even as we were developing a vision framework, um, I put them down and I'll show you in just a second, but six statements that start with every. Um, and uh, so we had different values that we valued multiplication, we valued collaboration, we valued diversity, we valued gospel centrality. Oh, sorry for that, it's gonna pop up again, I bet. Okay, sorry for that. Um, my, I, we don't have internet at the house right now, so that pops up and does crazy things. All right, so anyways, back to values. Why are we doing this? This is a really good, honest thing to ask yourself early on in the process. So why am I going to Calgary? Why am I going to Seattle? Why am I going to Hamlet, North Carolina? Why am I going to New York? Why am I going anywhere? Why am I staying right here? Why am I going to this church to revitalize? Why am I joining this uh, potential merger to replant a church? Why are we doing this? Well, we, we, we value gospel transformation. We value multiplication. We value uh, collaboration. We value uh, mobilizing lay leaders for ministry. So those are some of our core values. And each um, each church has its own unique set of values. Uh, Calvary Baptist in Winston Salem, um, they they are a, in a revitalization. Their values really stem from what was going on in the church and what the church would have valued and what the church should be valuing. Uh, such things as generational diversity uh, was an issue. And so they want to say we value having a diverse uh, congregation across multiple generations. We, va we value having uh, God's truth over our own opinions. So those are some other values. Gospel centrality, um, relationally driven. Those are some other really great value statements. Um, the next piece is the mission statement. And this is answering the question, what are we doing? And the mission statement, this is key, write this down. Your mission statement is your local church's own version of the Great Commission. Okay, So your mission is the Great Commission. It is to make disciples of all nations by going, baptizing, and teaching. We talked about this in, in the previous class on disciple making in North America. And so your mission is your your mission statement is basically your own unique restatement of the Great Commission. So for another example, since we just talked about Calvary, their mission statement is connecting people to Christ and community. That's it. You want it short, you don't want it long, you want it somewhere between five and maybe 15 words, um, but your mission statement says, well, what are we doing? Well, for Calvary, they are connecting people, okay, it tells you who you are, connecting people to Christ, evangelism, sharing, that's sharing the gospel, it's making disciples, connecting people, and that also includes worship, connecting people to Christ and to community. And for them, that means both their local community, their, their church community, and the community at large. So they connecting people to community means inviting them in for joint worship, for Bible fellowship, for discipleship relationships, and that sort of thing. And so your mission statement answers the question, what are we doing? Next, you look at your strategy. Well, how are we going to do it? What does it look like for us to enact and see this mission happen? So your mission says, well, if we want to see this happen, we want to connect people to Christ and community, like Calvary said, then what is our strategy? How are we going to do it? And so for, for, uh, for uh, Calvary, to continue the example, uh, they have what they call an evangelism discipleship pathway. And in that pathway, they want to connect people, and this is, they, they, and they, they use this a lot, they want to connect people up in and out, connect people out through evangelism, connect, oh, connect, connect people out to others through evangelism and service, connect people into each other through discipleship and connecting people up to God in worship. So that is their strategy. So everything they do as a church revolves around how you're connecting people in to each other, out through mission and service, and up to God in worship. So nothing else creeps in that doesn't fit with that strategy. Because for them, for them to connect people to Christ in community, they have to have a way of doing it. So that is what your strategy is. And then next is your measures. When are we successful? How do you know that your uh, mission has been accomplished. How do you know your strategy is working? We have measures. You ask yourself, well, when are we successful? Are we successful when we have, um, you know, 10% of our congregation sharing the gospel monthly? Well, that's kind of what's been happening uh, in the U.S. and Canada for a long time now, and that needs to change. We're, we're losing uh, North America um, uh, away from the gospel. And so how are you going to measure what, uh, what is success for your church? And so it's really good to give your strategy um, and your values kind of line up and say, okay, do we actually see diversity happening? Are we having, um, you know, our, um, our members having three gospel conversations a week? Maybe that's part of your measures, okay? When we have 50% of our congregation sharing the gospel three times a week, uh, then we know that we've made some progress. And if you got to that point, you are doing great, 
Trust me, that would be a, actually a really good number for where we are now, sadly. Um, so your measures are simply asking, when are we successful? And then that leads us to our vision. Where is God taking us? So you you create the four, you create the frame first. Remember, if you're if you're putting a picture together to hang on a wall, you get the frame established first, then you put the picture in it and hang on the wall for everyone to see. So your vision is simply asking the question, where is God taking us? And this is where it's different from mission. Mission says, what are we doing? Vision says, where? Okay, what versus where? And so vision, where is God taking us? Here's a definition that Mancini gives for vision proper there in the middle. Vision is the living language that anticipates and illustrates God's better intermediate future. Okay, and so in the book, he gives kind of examples of um, you know how how to differentiate between vision and mission. And I want to pull that up here and just kind of read those off, just to kind of show. All right, so here's how Mancini differentiates between mission and vision, because these are essential because a lot of churches and groups want to combine these, and they are really separate. Your mission is your compass; it gives that kind of guidance. While vision is like a travel brochure. It kind of lays out the future for you. Here's where you could be. Here's what you could be doing. Your mission defines the direction while your vision describes the future. Mission informs while vision inspires. Mission is about doing. Vision is about seeing. Mission is state in one breath. Vision is state of breathlessness. Whatever church's vision is, if you say it, so much good. Wow, that's that's what you're going after. Yeah, that's what God's led us to go after. Uh, mission directs energy. Vision creates energy. It is that vision statement that invigorates your people to want to be a part of what uh, God has led you to do? And then mission. Lastly, mission integrates activity. Vision encourages risk taking. So those are uh, uh, some simple uh, uh, differentiations between mission and vision. But remember, you have to build the whole frame in order to get to your vision proper. So let's transition now to discussing a perspective. We talked about a kingdom concept that helps us develop, develop a vision framework, which then leads us to creating a church planning perspectives. Now, uh, as you know, in the class, uh, you are making a prospectus. You're doing the background research for everything, and then you're going to put together something that's a little bit more of a, kind of like a brochure, explaining uh, the things that we have here. So a church planning prospectus is a simple, straightforward document explaining your calling, your context, your vision framework, your team, and your partnership needs. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of mine so you can kind of see uh, what this is. You're going to have several other examples I'm going to have you look through in the class. They'll be uploaded in Blackboard. Um, and you actually, um, you'll be um, asked in the, um, uh, on the Google Doc to actually research some other prospectuses uh, from other church plants. Um, and as, as I mentioned before, we, we really had a vision for not just planning a church, but to reach a city. So the prospectus that, that I'm about to show you is really kind of pers our prospectus 1.0 and 2.0 is going to come out in about uh, three to four months once we have a little more things put together now that we are on the ground. Um, but a perspective really is used whenever you are getting ready to meet with uh, maybe a church that wants to maybe partner with you in some way, maybe financially or through some other resources or maybe even sending some people. Uh, the pastor and the leaders, they're going to want to know what you're up to. They want to know a little bit about yourself and a little bit about what you believe. They want to hear your vision for what God is calling you to do. Uh, and so the perspectives document is actually like a, it could be a, maybe a, just a regular uh, couple sheets of paper stapled together. Uh, mine is right now until we develop 2.0. Um, it could be more like a brochure uh, that's really nicely designed and with graphics and really well put together. Uh, so there's many, many different versions. Um, the first one that I have is actually a website. And I still have it. If you look at uh, Christand.city, um, that is actually our website for Calgary. You can actually see the whole vision framework um, and everything we have, the whole perspective is actually outlined um, in a, uh, a couple web pages. And so uh, I want to show you mine to see how we kind of laid out our calling, the context, the vision framework, the team, and our partnership needs. And so um, so here's our uh, the kind of 1.0 version of our uh, vision uh, document. Um, essentially, we named it Saturate Calgary because uh, we don't have a church name yet. We wanted the, the new disciples that we gathered to actually name their own church. Um, so we don't have a church name yet, and uh, we want to figure out a little bit more. But we really just had a, our kingdom concept, like I mentioned earlier, was we, 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 we really want to see Satch, uh, uh, Calgary just filled with the gospel, saturated with the gospel. Uh, we wanted to give a chance for every man, woman, and child in Calgary to have 
daily opportunities to hear, see, and respond to the gospel. Uh, and so that kingdom concept led into our vision framework, which is now um, explained here. And so the first paragraph I have here is just simply a, a, a little bit of a note uh, of our family, the, the kind of last year that God has uh, been doing with us through the two different churches that were helping us, both 121 Church and Calvary Baptist in Winston. Um, and then we just affirmed that God is calling us to plant a church in the Rockies, um, in, the, in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, so I have a few... Um, uh, insights there about the city. And so you see the graphic there on the bottom right, the 95% of Calgarians do not know Jesus. Um, that's the negative side. The positive side is Calgary is a very growing city. It's a diverse city. It's a young city. It's a fluent city. It's a welcome city. It's an expanding city. So I want to give people an idea, okay, so where is Calgary? Uh, Calgary? I have a, a PowerPoint that I, um, basically a lot, all these pieces are on a PowerPoint and very simple and, and without all the words, of course, uh, more bullet points and things. But when I speak in churches, I this PowerPoint, and you know, I shared this good stuff. Calgary is a great city. It's, it's booming. It's uh, doing very well. It's very affluent. They have everything they need, except they do not have Jesus Christ. They don't have very few church. They have very few churches, and so, um, so I share that in here to get a snapshot of what is the city all about. And so and then we show the, the need there at the bottom yeah, with all the excitement. Calgary is 95 percent of the order. There are over 1.33 million Calgarians who do not know Jesus Christ. Um, over a third of Calgarians claim no religion whatsoever. Um, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, Mormonism are the religions that are increasing while Christianity has been on the decline for um, half a decade, I mean half a century. Uh, there is one Canadian National Baptist Church, which, the, which is the Southern Baptist version in Canada, uh, for every 44,586 people. That's not really good. Um, it was about one for every 1,500 to 2,000 where I came from in Winston-Salem. Um, and it's less than 5% of people who call Calgary home have been identified as evangelical Christians. Um, so there's a big need in Calgary. So you want to show, so uh, this is kind of the context a little bit. Um, the next, we uh, kind of really from there outline our vision. And uh, that had a little bit of our call, a little bit of our context. And here's our vision framework. Um, this has everything but the measures. I'm actually still working on the measures part and I had that come out in 2.0 now that we know a little bit more uh, once we get here. Uh, but our vision, we actually put our vision statement first, even though when you build it, you do that part last. But with the vision, we want to have it first. So our vision is simply to, sat is to saturate Calgary with the gospel of Christ. So that is the big, that is the future. That's what we want to see happen. The, the question, where is God taking us? He's taking us to see a city saturated with the gospel of Christ. Our mission statement then, or how we will accomplish it, our restatement of the Great Commission is simply multiplying disciples, leaders, and churches. That's what we're going to focus on. Now, this will evolve and change. Even both of these statements will evolve and change once we have a group of Christians together and they are giving input to what the vision and mission of the church should be. So these are these uh, may change, but for right now, this is what uh, Jill and I really agreed on um, as a church planning couple that we really want to see happen. So we want to be about multiplying not just uh, disciples, not just leaders, but churches. So we want to focus on doing all three. You can't have... You can't multiply new churches unless you have multiplied more disciples. You can't have uh, you can't multiply more churches if you don't have leaders to lead those churches. Okay, and so it's a natural byproduct of disciple making, leadership development, church multiplication. Next is our values, and so these are our uh, six statements. That uh, of course these may change as well, uh, but in my presentation when I'm sharing, I've um, often uh, ask the question to the congregation. So, what does Jesus desire? What does He want to do in the world today? And I basically conclude that. He desires every person from every place. He loves his creation. He loves every person. He desires that none should perish, but all should reach repentance, as uh, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 states. And you see in Revelation, they have the myriads and a thousand different languages and tongues who are all together worshiping God. And so our values then, we actually design our values. This is, a, I think it's a good tip for, for you uh, as you put together perspectives. Um, what I try to do is make it sound like it would fit Calgary. So I started researching the city, looked at the, the city website, the development website, I just tried to saturate my mind in Calgary things, listening and reading articles and different things, and tried to hear, okay, what are the things that they value? What does the website say that they really value? Well, when I was up here and talking with people, I would ask questions related to our values. Um, the city is a very diverse city. Um, over 25% of uh, Calgary are foreign born. They're not from Canada, but they're from somewhere else. And there are over 140 different um, um, 140 languages and 240 ethnicities represent this one city. So it's a very diverse city, and they value that. So we wanted to value that as well. That's why you see our uh, next to last one is everyone is welcome to be part of God's family. That represents our value 
um, of diversity that mirrors theirs as well. So the first one is every man, woman, child needs Jesus. We value gospel transformation. Uh, we value that every decision depends on prayer. We're not going to do anything or make any kind of decision unless we have saturated it in prayer. We want God to do direct what His church in our local expression does. We value that every member makes disciples. Now this is big. This is Ephesians 4.12. This is where we come into our job as leaders and pastors is to equip others equip the saints for the work of the ministry, not do it all of ourselves. And so we want to start, start from the very beginning that we value investing in and sending out and equipping every single person in the church. What I like to share when I speak about uh, Calvary is that uh, we want every man, woman, and child in our church to reach every man, woman, child in the community that God takes us to. Uh, the fourth one there, every place calls for presence. Um, this is our uh, really relates to the value that Calgary has as far as separating every everyone into very localized communities. So uh, the community, each community is five to twenty-five thousand people, uh, and they have you know very clear boundaries. So when you when you come to Calgary and you you talk with someone, you say, oh, so where uh, where you live or uh, uh, what side of town? They don't say, well, I'm from South Calgary, or I'm from North Calgary, I'm from downtown. They give you, I'm from Nolan Hill, I'm from Kincora. I'm from Mahogany. I'm from Cranston. There's over 200 communities like that. And so they really put a value on place. Each of, the, each of those communities has its own shopping center. Many have their own schools. Uh, you can do, you can um, have all your life and never really have to leave your very small micro community. And so these communities are literally a mile square. You have five to 10,000 people packed in a mile square. Uh, our community is Nolan Hill that we just moved into. Uh, and it's, a, it's kind of a rectangle about a, a mile, about a mile and a half long. And there's going to be 6,000 people. They're still building it. We're I actually, you may even hear some of the uh, bobcats and diggers and things right outside my window. They're building a house literally next door to us. And um, so if you hear that slam, that's uh, everything is okay in the house. Um, but they really value these communities. They're building new ones. So ours is going to have about 6,000 people living in a very, very small area. Uh, the fifth one there we already mentioned, everyone is welcome to be part of God's family. The motto of the city of Calgary, when you drive into Calgary, you see the sign that says, you know, like, welcome to, it says, Calgary, be part of the energy. And on their website, uh, their economic development website, the statement is, everyone is welcome to be part of the energy. So the values, they're, they're very pluralistic, they're very diverse. And so for us, that uh, our statement here, our value that everyone is welcome to be part of, be part of God's family really mirrors uh, number one, uh, it kind of mirrors, in a way, their their mission, uh, their um, uh, value statement of everyone is welcome to be part of the energy. So we just say, well, everyone is welcome to be part of God's family. Uh, it doesn't matter your socioeconomic status, your ethnicity, or even which community you come from, uh, which country you come from that has led you to Calgary. You are welcome to be part of our church. Now, this is not this is not talking about membership. It's not saying that um, anyone can just come and automatically join. We we do have prerequisites for membership, such as salvation and baptism. So forth. Um, but we want to value that everyone is welcome to come. Anyone can come and step into one of our worship services or join some of our small groups or join us in ministry. People, We want people to join us as we're sharing the gospel and leading them to Christ and discipling them in Christ. And the last one is everything we do is for the glory of Christ and the good of Calgary. And this really helps us balance our ministry. So everything we do, we're thinking in our minds, and I'm thinking as a leader, how are we glorifying Christ through this and at the same time bringing blessing to the city? How are we doing both? Because often we can say, we want to do anything for the glory of God, and that's really, really good. But we often will either misinterpret Scripture or just not understand that we also have to do helps for other people. So this, this, this compels us, this value leads us to do service for people. It leads us to do community ministry. It leads us to collaborate with other churches to see these things happen. It leads us to collaborate with city and civic organizations for the good of our city. Because as we're doing that, we are sharing the gospel as we're bringing blessing. We are um, handing out a box of food, so to say, while we are sharing the gospel and loving them towards Christ. And so uh, that is our last uh, kind of uh, value statement. Here's our strategy, and I'll go through this uh, quickly. Um, uh, we're still defining this, and this, of course, all this is uh, subject to change once we have a group forming. Uh, but we really say that who we are, our identity is a gospel community. That is what we are, and out of that flow the three things, the three components of our strategy. And this really mirrors the connecting up in and out that I mentioned earlier. Uh, first one is gospel conversation. In a city that has 95% loss, we have to share the gospel verbally a lot. So we want to have gospel conversations with those who do not know Christ. We also want to have gospel conversations with the believers, with those who are in our church. 
We want to preach the gospel to ourselves and to each other every day as we practice one another's of scripture. We lift each other up in the in, in scripture and in prayer. Uh, and we encourage each other in our small group format. So we want to have gospel conversations happening all the time. Uh, we also want to celebrate the gospel together. We want to get together on you know, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, whenever we can uh, find a meeting place and we have enough critical mass to start worshiping together in a, in a corporate worship gathering. We want to celebrate what God is doing. We want to worship God. We want to celebrate Him. And we also want to celebrate what's happening. Remember, our value is everything we do is for the glory of Christ and the good of Calgary. And so for that, we want to worship God during our celebration services. Uh, of course, we want to do it. We want to preach the word. We want to uh, compel people to repent who, uh, who are in the congregation and sitting uh, who do not know Christ. We also we want to take that time to celebrate what's happening in our city, to celebrate the stories of life change that are happening in our in our community. And the last one is gospel collaboration. So this is kind of interesting as part of a strategy. Um, but our strategy, if we want to see saturation happen, remember, saturating Calgary, Calgary with the gospel of Christ is our vision. If we want to see that happen, our strategy must include collaborating with other churches. We can't do it alone. There's no way that one church plan from North Carolina can reach a city that has over 1.3 million lost people. It just cannot happen. We must work together with other uh, churches and other evangelical leaders. So we're starting with the other Baptists that I'm connected with, but we're expanding out. In two weeks, I'm having a lunch meeting with a uh, pastor of one of the Harvest Bible Chapels that's here in Calgary as well. And I hope to meet other uh, evangelical pastors and leaders so we can start saying, how can we work together? How can we share resources? How can you come and help train my people in something that I'm not that great at training people at? So how can we work together? So our strategy includes doing all those things, and then our measures, which isn't listed here, our measures will include how are people having gospel conversations? Or is, is every person in our church having at least two or three gospel conversations each week? Am I as a leader having them daily? Okay, We want to measure our celebrations, not just the number of people sitting there, but are we able to have a congregation start to form once we have uh, you know, four groups going? And then when we have eight groups who are meeting, it's maybe time to start a second church. It's time to start a second gospel celebration. We also want to know and measure um, our, our level of collaboration. How many churches are we really collaborating with and is that working? How are we collaborating with the city organizations and the community associations uh, that already have a pulse on the needs and the, the heartbeat of what's going on in this community? How are we collaborating with them? And so we want to measure those. So that strategy measures. And then uh, part of a perspective is you always want to have a timeline. Um, we also see, well, let me backtrack just a second. You see down here our goal is to have one gospel community for every 1,000 people in our community, quadrant, and city. So that is the only measure that we really have right here is that for every 1,000 people, we want to have at least one gospel community group, a small group meeting. So here in Nolan Hill where I live, we want to have five to six groups happening at least in our community. And we want to have five or six happening in Sage Hill next door because they have about five, 6,000 people as well. We want to have maybe a dozen to 13 happening in Evanston because they, they're next door and they've got about 13,000 uh, people living there. So that's one measurement that we will help us know. If we're, are we going towards saturation? Uh, we know we are if we have at least um, a, a one a small group happening for every thousand people. And that's just a start. That's one, that's 15 people out of a thousand. That's a whole lot better percentage than uh, 5% or the, the 95% who are lost. And you know, So now transition now to timeline. Each Your perspective should kind of lay out simply uh, your general timeline of when they, they want to know when is it going to happen. So I have here when we're going to move, our, our initial process of just kind of uh, listening, learning, and loving our community, building relationships, how we're going to you know start working in the fall to really begin towards our worship gathering. We'll be building small groups and that sort of thing. And then hopefully around April 2018, we want to start um, an actual public worship service. Now, will be a church before then uh, because I don't believe that you have to have a Sunday morning worship service to call yourself a church um, but that would be the uh, hopefully in, in the spring of 2018 is when we'll have our first public worship service where we're getting our small groups together um, and we're joining in gospel celebration and then the last page that I have um, is simply more of the partnership connecting um, and so uh, remember our, our components here calling context vision framework team and partnership needs now our team right now um, is uh, my family um, and uh, one other young lady named Beth who's already here. So if you look on our website, uh, she is listed on the website and has her statement here. Um, I have yet to put it here on this document. Uh, but you want a page that kind of lays out your team. If you have another pastor, co-pastor who's joining you, uh, you want to have a little bit about him um, as well. If you look on our website, it has a little bit more full, uh, fully explaining a little bit more about our team. 
Um, but this is the, the partnership recruitment page, basically. Uh, we were recruiting, uh, the last seven months we spent uh, traveling around recruiting ministry partners, and we said we want you to pray, come, and give. All right. So pray. We wanted 100 small groups who will pray for us on a regular basis. So for prayer, I want the burden of prayer to be on the small group leaders, the Sunday school teachers, the home group leaders, so that on Sunday morning the pastor is not standing up saying, hey, we got the email newsletter from the Connors, and here's some things to pray for, some updates. I don't want that to have to come from the pulpit. I want it to come from the teachers and the um, um, in the uh, in the classes and the home groups. And so we we were asking people to simply sign up. Uh, would you be one? It had an online form on a website you can fill out and just sign up right there. And we also had partner cards that we took uh, to each church. They could just fill out their name, email, the church name, and they could just check off. Uh, I'm a Sunday school teacher. My my small group we won the 100, and so uh, we wanted 100, and we got about 60. So we, we made really good progress. We also wanted a thousand individuals who will pray, and uh, we right now have 400 who have signed up either through an online or one of our partner cards to just say I will commit to pray for you. And basically that means they get our email newsletter. And so uh, between the thousand individuals and the 60 small groups that we have averaged out, we've got about a thousand people um, who are praying for us right now, which is amazing, and we are so thankful for. Um, we also talked with partners about coming. Uh, come for a week on mission. Bring mission teams and help us uh, do some events and things and help us run camps for kids. Help us just build a relationship in the community so we can have an avenue for sharing the gospel and build trust. Um, we also asked um, for some some uh, specialized uh, ministry people to come maybe for do some leadership training. Uh, to come and help do some evangelism training or uh, help with preaching or something along those lines. So I've got about a dozen uh, pastors and other leaders who they kind of have a niche that they're really good at. I want them to come and spend three or four days training our people, and that's another way of coming. And the last one is giving. And I tell you, fundraising, is uh, I thought was not going to be fun, but how God blessed, it actually became a really fun endeavor. So you want to lay out your ministry needs. Um, financial needs. Now, whatever uh, denominational group or network you go through, they will coach you through how to not only build this prospectus, but also what your needs will be. So I went to the North American Mission Board, and they laid out uh, for me pretty well, uh, here are uh, here is the, the, the most you can raise in your uh, city, here is the cost of living. So they had these like different percentages, and you just basically type in stuff, and it kind of lays out, okay, here's how much you need to raise in order to live here. So they, they helped me figure that out. Um, and so Calgary is a very expensive city, and so we actually needed to raise $9,000 a month for uh, our support. Now, this is not all uh, for my paycheck. Um, you see about 53.5% for living expenses, um, and then 30% is for ministry expenses. The others are a different kind of insurance and kind of retirement type costs that we have as being uh, on the, the visa that we have here in Canada. And uh, so, in, order, in other words, we had to raise money for not only paying rent and buying food and gas in the car, uh, we also uh, raised money uh, for doing um, you know, events in the community, evangelism materials, discipleship materials, Bibles, and all that sort of thing, uh, a printer, a scanner, that sort of thing, and paper and whatnot, gas mileage, meals with lost people, all those type of things we were raising money for. And right now we're 97% funded, so we are fully um, able to be here for the first two years uh, with, a much, with the funding that we need. Um, and so you want to lay out your financial needs on here as well because they want to know, okay, um, if our church does decide to partner with you, we want to bring some mission teams, we want to pray for you, but we also want to help support you financially. We believe in the vision that you have cast. Um, and so uh, for us, we have the monthly ministry needs, and then we also have some special needs, uh, moving expenses. We relocated to another country 2,700 miles away, and so we had U-Haul expenses, and uh, that was a five-day trip, and a you know, motel, food, and that sort of thing. And across the board, you had different taxes and tariffs and things where you bring your goods across. And so you want to research what's it going to cost you to get there and find out what what kind of uh, cost do we have up front if you're a little bit ahead of the game and you know about when you'll be having your first uh, worship service you may need to raise some money to buy um, audiovisual equipment uh, projectors maybe chairs or something like that so we have not uh, we've raised some money for that but we have not fully because we don't know where we're going to meet yet and so once we get closer to that point we'll do some more fundraising pushes and try to help get some um, equipment needed, uh, ministry trailer, that sort of thing, so we will be a mobile church. Uh, and then of course, you always want to have your contact info so that uh, when you hand this to somebody, they know how to get in contact, they know what website to go to. So I have our website, our Facebook page, my email, my cell phone number, my Twitter, um, every multiple ways that they can contact me um, so that when they look at this perspective and say, you know what, I really buy in, I really believe in what you're doing, we want to be a part in some way, prayer, current, praying, coming, or giving, they have something that they can take and that they can um, uh, kind of
kind of see what you're looking to do. Um, so that concludes what we're talking about today with vision framework and prospectus. And so this is really a key, key, key essential step at the very beginning to help uh, get you to where God is leading you.